Welcome in, everyone, to a very special franchise review on Cabin of Horrors podcast. We're going over one of the most influential, iconic, and cult classic horror franchises of all time. This guy is definitely on the Mount Rushmore of horror villains when it comes to all the iconic classic slashers that we've had from the 80s, and that's Freddy Krueger. We are going to go over the entire A Nightmare on Elm Street franchise over the next few weeks. We're going to dive in and talk a little bit about the franchise as a whole, and then we're going to dive in and talk about the first film, A Nightmare on Elm Street. And then subsequent episodes will have the rest of the franchise. So next week, we're going to go over A Nightmare on Elm Street 2, 3, and 4. And then the week after that, we're going to review A Nightmare on Elm Street 5, 6, and New Nightmare. We'll also probably talk a little bit about the really crappy reboot that uh, we got later on, but I don't think we need to give that too much attention, right? I don't think that's such a good idea. <laughs> that movie was terrible. If you've seen the uh, Nightmare on Elm Street reboot, I think it was James Earl Haley or something was the guy who played Freddy Krueger. Man, it was bad. It was an absolute shit show. We'll talk a little bit about that on this episode, but we're not going to dive deep into that. Freddy Krueger is probably if not the most iconic, one of the most iconic horror slashers ever, period. Like, he's up there with Leatherface, Michael Myers, Jason Voorhees. Everybody knows Freddy Krueger. Even if you're not a horror fan, you know who Freddy Krueger is. <laughs> like, if you think of a killer who kills you in your dreams, everybody will think of Freddy Krueger. And that's how you know that you've created something that transcends itself. Because anyone can create a horror villain right? But it takes a lot to create a slasher that really sticks with horror fans. Like, look at Art the Clown. Art the Clown is a slasher that is that sticks with horror fans. Horror fans love Art the Clown. He is a slasher for a new generation, and he is the slasher that everyone right now wants more of. But Art the Clown is not a mainstream slasher. Like, if I were to go out on the street right now and I were to ask somebody, hey, do you know who Art the Clown is? Chances are they do not know who Art the Clown is. Art the Clown is not mainstream. All the horror fans, if you go to a horror fan and say, do you know Art the Clown? They're like, hell yeah. But a lot of mainstream people don't know him. However, if I went up to a random person on the street and said, hey, have you ever heard of Freddy Krueger? They're going to say yes. Like 80 to 90% chance they're going to say yes. Or they're going to be like, oh, is that that, that guy in, who kills kids in their dreams in the movies? Like everybody knows Freddy Krueger. And that's how you know you've done something right when you can create something that transcends the horror genre. People who don't even watch horror movies or are horror fans know who Freddy Krueger is. Now, before we dive deep into A Nightmare on Elm Street. I want to talk a little bit about Cabin, a little bit about Cabin of Horrors and what's coming up, what's going on, all that kinds of fun stuff. Because there's a lot of cool stuff coming out of Cabin of Horrors in the next few months. A lot of cool stuff. First of all, if you don't know already, our Patreon is now live. And if you're not following us on Instagram, come over to instagram.com slash Cabin of Horrors podcast that is where you will find all of the most up-to-date information on the podcast. My community of people are amazing, and I love each and every one of you, and that's why you are always the first to know. So make sure you're following Cabin of Horrors podcast on Instagram to get all of the latest up-to-date news as soon as it drops. So the first thing that I want to talk about is the Patreon. So what we're going to be doing with the Patreon is a couple of things. One, we're going to be releasing Patreon subscriber-only episodes. So if you go over to the Patreon and you become a supporter, I think it starts at like $3 Canadian, which is pennies if you're an American, by the way. <laughs> so head on over to the Patreon. We're going to have exclusive podcast episodes going up there. We have one episode up right now. It is the Evil Dead reboot, where we go and dive into Fede Alvarez's Evil Dead reboot that came out in, I believe, 2013. And we talk about the behind the scenes. We talk about the movie itself, just like we would here on on the podcast as normal but these are episodes that nobody will hear unless you are a supporter of cabin of horrors podcast so if you head over to the patreon become a supporter you can listen to the evil dead episode right now and there will be more episodes coming out in the coming weeks so make sure you're a subscriber so you don't miss an episode and you can get all of the awesome horror content from yours truly the incredible josh Second, there's another project that I've kind of been talking about with you guys, but I haven't really given any information on, and that's A Nightmare on 13th. 
A Nightmare on the 13th is a brand new project that I'm going to be revealing in April. And what it is, is a reimagining or retelling of sorts of your favorite horror movies in a 1960s radio show format. Are you confused yet? <laughs> so what this is going to be, it's going to be a 1960s radio horror show format. So it's going to sound just like a 1960s horror radio show. But it's going to be myself telling a story to you. And that story is going to be a reimagining of a horror movie. So it could be something like Halloween. It could be Black Christmas. It could be Exorcist. It could be Insidious. It could be Sinister. You'll never know what the story will be unless you tune in. But that story will be read to you in a 1960s horror radio show format, which I think is really cool. I think it's a very unique way of retelling the stories of our favorite horror movies and bringing back a format that has not necessarily died, but is dying out, right? I know a lot of people like video content, a lot of people like short form content, and that's great. That's awesome. But I am here to give you something that has been lost to the ether. Radio audio shows are a thing of the past, and there's no doubt about that. But I'm going to bring it back for a 1960s horror show feel. And how I'm going to do that is I'm going to be live on Twitch. That's right. I'm coming back onto Twitch in April. And Twitch will actually get the first look at Nightmare on the 13th. Unless you're a Patreon subscriber. If you are a Patreon subscriber, you will get early access to it before everybody else. But if you're not, then you're going to need to watch it on April 13th, live on Twitch. That will be the first episode of Nightmare on the 13th, April 13th, 2023, live on Twitch. And make sure you catch it live because you don't know if you're ever going to be able to watch it again. Will it be on YouTube after? I don't know. But you better head over to Twitch and give me a follow, twitch.tv slash cabin of horrors. That way, if you're following me, you'll get a notification when we go live. And it'll be April 13th that not only will I be making a big comeback on Twitch, <laughs> but you will also get to see the first episode of Nightmare on the 13th. So mark that down on your calendars, April 13th, 2023. And that's really it on the Cabin of Horrors front, so let's dive in. Let's talk more now about A Nightmare on Elm Street and Freddy Krueger. The basis for the original Nightmare on Elm Street film was said to have been inspired by several newspaper articles that were printed in the LA Times during the 1970s, based on a group of refugees who, after fleeing to America, were suffering disturbing nightmares after which they refused to sleep. Some of the men even died in their sleep soon after. Medical authorities called the phenomenon Asian Death Syndrome. The condition itself afflicted only men between the ages of 19 to 57, and it was believed to be Sudden Unexplained Death Syndrome and or Brugada Syndrome. The 1970s pop song Dreamweaver by Gary Wright also sealed the story for Craven. It gave him not only an artistic setting to kind of jump off from, but also a synthesizer riff from the Elm Street soundtrack as well. Initially, Freddy Krueger was actually intended to be a child molester, but Wes Craven decided to characterize him as a child murderer instead because he wanted to avoid being accused of exploiting the highly publicized child molestation cases that were occurring in California around the time of production of the film. The name of Fred Krueger comes from Wes Craven's adolescent experiences. He had been bullied at school by a child named Fred Krueger, and of course, that's what he names his villain. <laughs> The colored sweater that Freddy Krueger wears, the red and green stripes, he chose this because it was based on the DC Comics character Plastic Man, but the colors of red and green for the sweater came to him after reading an article in Scientific American in 1982, which said that the two most clashing colors to the human retina were red and green. There was also serious development toward a prequel for Freddy's story, which Robert Unglund had revealed, and it was called The First Kills, which would have been centered around two policemen chasing for the Springwood slasher and two lawyers during the legal proceedings. Unglund claims that John McNaughton was considered for directing the prequel, but these plans were forgotten after New Line Cinema was merged with Turner Broadcasting in 1994. McNaughton came back later around the millennium shift and tried to produce an alternative prequel story alongside scriptwriter R.J. Tsarov, which was going to be set in hell, which is kind of an interesting premise. McNaughton had imagined that Freddy would be stuck in between his lynching and the events of the 1984 film. The reason why New Line Cinema had rejected this idea, though, 
was because it was around the time of Little Nicky. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that or remember that movie, Little Nicky with Adam Sandler. One of my favorite Adam Sandler movies. I love it. That movie was also set in hell and at the time was a box office bomb. So the company didn't really want to produce another film that was set in hell. But I think it was a box office bomb because the kind of comedy that Adam Sandler had in that in that movie was kind of niche. I enjoyed it, but I, I can see why it was a box office bomb. Then on January 29th, 2008, Variety reported that Michael Bay was going to be rebooting the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise with a remake of the original 1984 film. And I'm sure many of you agree with me when I say that that was probably one of the worst ideas they ever came up with because the reboot of A Nightmare on Elm Street was absolute shit. It was, it was really, really that bad. They were trying to provide some kind of freshness to the character of Freddy Krueger when it wasn't necessary. First of all, they were abandoning the things that quote-unquote made the character less scary. So Freddy wouldn't be cracking jokes, which was a staple of his character in pretty much in most of the franchise. And instead, they were focusing more on trying to craft a quote-unquote horrifying film, which totally flopped. It didn't go well with horror fans at all. Even to this day, nobody says they like that reboot. <laughs> nobody does. It, and it didn't even have Robert Unglund in it, which is probably the biggest bone of contention. But at the same time, they didn't make a good Freddy Krueger movie or Nightmare on Elm Street, however you want to label it. And when you compare the franchise of A Nightmare on Elm Street with other top grossing horror series like Child's Play, Friday the 13th, Halloween, all those guys, it's the third highest grossing horror franchise in the United States. It's brought in a total of about $583.4 million, which is pretty good bank for a horror movie franchise, which is probably why it keeps getting more entries. There's been talks about a reboot and another movie in the series for quite some time now, but nothing's actually been announced or set in stone as to where we're going with the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. Which is okay, because what we're going to be talking about is the entire franchise from start to finish, right up until now. We're even going to talk about the crappy reboot. Not in great detail, because it's not worth that much time, but it's still part of the franchise, so we're going to include it. Just like I talked about Season of the Witch when we did the Halloween series episodes last year. Still talked about Season of the Witch, even though it's the bastard child, it's still part of the franchise. The Rob Zombie Halloweens, not part of the franchise. <laughs> so that's how I got away with that one. The first Nightmare on Elm Street, it's not only an iconic entry into the horror genre as a whole, it gave us Freddy Krueger. It also gave us one of the most popular, prolific Hollywood stars in the entire world, and that's Johnny Depp. This was Johnny Depp's first feature movie. The only reason he even got casted in the role was because Wes Craven's daughter threatened to run away if he wasn't casted in that role because she had a major crush on him or something, I think. Let's talk a little bit about Freddy Krueger. He's drawn from a lot of Wes Craven's early life. There was one night when a young Wes Craven saw an elderly man walking on the sidewalk outside the window of his house. The man stopped and glanced at Craven a little bit, and it startled him, and the man walked off. This is what served as the inspiration for Freddy Krueger. Craven has stated on Freddy's nature is that, in a sense, Freddy stands for the worst of parenthood and adulthood. He's the dirty old man, he's the nasty father, and the adult who wants children to die rather than help them prosper. He's the boogeyman in the worst fear of children. And by Wes Craven's account, his own adolescent experiences led him to naming Freddy Krueger. As I mentioned earlier, he had been bullied at school by a child named Fred Krueger. He'd also actually done the same thing in his film, uh, The Last House on the Left, from 1972. The villain's name was shortened to Krug. And Craven really wanted to make Freddy Krueger different from other horror film villains of the era. Because a lot of killers were wearing masks, right? Leatherface wears a mask, Michael Myers, Jason... But Freddy really sets himself apart because he's not wearing a costume. He's not wearing a mask. It's literally his face, but he's been badly burned. Alongside this, Craven also figured that the villain shouldn't use a knife because it was too common in horror movies at the time. So Craven had thought, how about using a glove with steak knives attached to them? And he gave the idea to their special effects guy, Jim Doyle, which he went off to make two models of the glove 
the hero glove that was only used whenever anything needed to be cut, and then the stunt glove that was, well, less likely to cause injury. And there was a period of time where Wes Craven had considered a sickle as the weapon of choice for Freddy Krueger, but around the third or fourth drafts of the script, that's when the glove had become his final choice. Wes Craven began writing the screenplay for A Nightmare on Elm Street around 1981, after he had wrapped up production on The Swamp Thing. He had pitched it to several studios, but each one of them had rejected it for a variety of different reasons. Funny enough, the first studio to show interest in A Nightmare on Elm Street was actually Walt Disney Productions. Can, can you believe that? They honestly were the first people to show interest in Kruger, but they wanted Craven to tone down the content and make it suitable for a PG-13 film. Obviously, Craven declined that. You can't have Freddy Krueger in a PG-13 horror movie. But that's an interesting fact that Disney was almost the house that held Freddy Krueger. <laughs> Could you imagine? Craven then went on and pitched A Nightmare on Elm Street to Paramount Pictures. But they passed on the project because it was too similar to Dreamscape from 1984. Universal Studios also passed, and then Craven really got desperate and was in financial straits during this period. And that's when a fledgling and independent company came out of the woodwork to save the day. New Line Cinema. Up until this point, New Line Cinema had only distributed films. They hadn't produced anything, so they actually agreed to produce A Nightmare on Elm Street. New Line's distribution deal for the film fell through. And then for two weeks, it wasn't able to pay any cast or crew. And despite the fact that, you know, nowadays New Line Cinema is very well known, they've produced and distributed a variety of high-class blockbuster films, A Nightmare on Elm Street was actually the first commercial success for New Line Cinema. And they actually often refer to the studio as the house that Freddy built. New Line Cinema really lacked the financial resources for the production themselves, so they had to turn to external financers to get the film out into the public. So they found two investors in England, who each contributed 40 and 30% respectively, and then one of the producers of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre actually contributed 10%, and then the home video distributor Media Home Entertainment contributed 20% of the original budget. However, four weeks before production began, the English investor who had contributed 40% ended up backing out. But then Media Home Entertainment added in another 40% to the budget. People believed in this film. Like seriously, to have financial backers, so many financial backers from different areas of the world, really, like we got one from England, we got some in America, and then to have one back out, but then the other investor goes, that's okay, I'll cover his share, that's a big deal. That is a big deal because if you are coming in to an investment opportunity and you're like, yeah, you know, I'm coming in at 10%, that is what you are expecting. And then to turn around and add another 30% onto that out of nowhere, that shows that they had serious hope and really felt that this film was going to become the blockbuster success that it was. They knew. They knew what was up with Freddy. <laughs> like, they knew ahead of time. The original budget for the film was actually $700,000, but it ended up getting up to about $1.1 million by the end of it. Now, the casting of Freddy. Robert Ungland wasn't the original choice to play Freddy Krueger in Nightmare on Elm Street. Originally, David Warner was cast to play Freddy. There was even makeup tests done, but he had to drop out due to scheduling conflicts. And replacing him, of course, was difficult. However... There was another horror icon who was actually talked to by Wes Craven to play Freddy Krueger. I actually didn't know this, and I don't know how many other people know this, but Kane Hodder was actually approached by Wes Craven and talked to about the role of Freddy. So Kane Hodder could have been both Freddy and Jason. <laughs> could you imagine... The Freddy vs. Jason film would have looked a lot different if Kane Hodder was Freddy. Oh man, that, that would have been a lot different. And here's an exact quote from Kane Hodder 
about the role itself. He says, I had a meeting with Wes Craven about playing a character he was developing called Freddy Krueger. At the time, Wes wasn't sure what kind of person he wanted for the role of Freddy, so I had as good of a shot as anybody else. He was initially thinking of a big guy for the part, and he was also thinking of somebody who had real burn scars. But obviously, he changed his whole line of thinking and went with Robert Unglund, who's smaller. I would have loved to play the part, but I do think Wes made the right choice. I think he did too, because, you know, Kane Hodder went on to become literally the best Jason Voorhees in existence. Like, I'm pretty sure ev when everybody says, like, who's your favorite Jason Voorhees actor? It's Kane Hodder. Like, there's nobody better that played Jason Voorhees than Kane Hodder. Principal photography on the film began on June 11th in 1984 and lasted a total of 32 days. It was also conducted in and around Los Angeles, California. The high school that the protagonists attend was filmed at John Marshall High School, where there was actually a couple of other very uh, prominent films filmed there. There was Grease. Grease filmed at John Marshall High School, and so did Pretty in Pink. So the schools in Greece and Pretty in Pink were also in A Nightmare on Elm Street. How messed up is that? During production of A Nightmare on Elm Street, there was over 500 gallons of fake blood used for special effects. 500 gallons of fake blood was used. That is amazing. Now I know where Fide Alvarez got his idea from. <laughs> for Evil Dead. <laughs> For the Blood Geyser sequence, the filmmakers used the same revolving room set that was used for Tina's death. And while filming the scenes, the cameraman and Craven himself were mounted in fixed seats that were taken from a Datsun B210 car while the set rotated. The film crew inverted the set and attached the camera so that it looked like the room was right side up. Then they poured the red water into the room. They used dye water because, of course, the special effects blood didn't have the right look for a geyser. And during the filming of this scene, the red water had, had poured out in an unexpected way. And it caused the rotating room to actually spin. So much of the water spilled out of the bedroom window, which covered Craven and Langenkamp. They also used gravity to film another take for the TV version in which a skeleton shoots out from the hollowed out bed and then smashes into the ceiling. Because obviously for the you know TV version, they're not going to have a fountain of blood coming up from the middle of the bed and filling the entire room with blood, right? That's actually a really great scene. You know, the scene where Johnny Depp gets sucked into his bed and the, the fountain of blood comes up. That's probably my favorite scene in A Nightmare on Elm Street. Outside of the end scene where the mom gets dragged through the window... And the only reason I like that scene is because you can tell it's a doll. You can tell it's, it's like a mannequin blow-up doll getting pulled through the door window. It's, I don't know, it's a good practical, but it's just, it's so funny. And there was always something about A Nightmare on Elm Street that I felt was missing and that I wish they expanded on more. And that was the boiler room. I don't feel like it got enough attention in the first, one, in the first entry of the franchise. And there was actually more work done for Freddy's boiler room than what made it into the film. The film crew constructed literally a whole sleeping place for Freddy, which showed that he was, you know, quite a hobo in a sense. He was an outcast. He was a reject from society. He lived and slept where he worked. And he surrounded himself with naked Barbie dolls and other things that showcased his fantasies and perversions. This place in the boiler room was also supposed to be where he forged his glove and abducted and murdered his victims. I really feel like they should have added more of that in Nightmare on Elm Street, right? Give us more of the boiler room early on. I don't think there was enough of it. I don't think they really cemented the boiler room as his place in the first movie. They could have done more. They really could have done more to make the boiler room the place where he kills his victims instead of focusing so much on the dream aspect. Like, I like the dream gimmick. I like the idea of he invades dreams and that's where he kills them. The dreamland is where he lives. But I feel like in that dreamland, they should have put more focus on the boiler room. I, that's just my opinion. I really think that there should have been more focus on the boiler room in the first movie, but that's my opinion. I know it's more focused on later on, but the first one, they had a chance there. And let's talk a little bit about another iconic scene in the film, which is the glove in the bathtub. I'm sure everybody knows what scene I'm talking about. This was a scene where Nancy was attacked by Freddy Krueger in her bathtub, and they accomplished it by using a special bottomless tub. The tub itself was put in a bathroom set, and it was built actually over a swimming pool. 
and during the underwater sequence, Langenkamp was replaced with a stunt woman. The melting staircase in Nancy's dream was actually Robert Shea's idea, and it was based on one of his own nightmares, and they created it using pancake mix. Like, how creative can you get for 80s horror movies to use pancake mix as a special effect? Man, that's creativity right there. There's also a pretty cool Easter egg about halfway through A Nightmare on Elm Street. The part where Nancy's trying to stay awake, there's actually a scene from Sam Raimi's Evil Dead movie that appears on a television. Craven actually decided to include this scene because Raimi had featured a Hills Have Eyes poster in the Evil Dead movie. In return, of course, you know, this was a back and forth thing between Craven and Raimi. Raimi actually featured a Freddy Krueger glove in the workshed scene of Evil Dead 2, and later in Ash vs. Evil Dead, which was actually a set piece that was stolen from A Nightmare on Elm Street 3. <laughs> they had stolen the glove off the set of A Nightmare on Elm Street 3, and it later appeared in the Evil Dead series. <laughs> you gotta love Sam Raimi's sense of humor. As for the ending of A Nightmare on Elm Street, Craven originally planned for the film to have a more evocative ending. Nancy was going to kill Kruger by not believing in him entirely. Then she would awaken to discover that everything that happened in the film was just an elongated nightmare. However, Robert Shea demanded there to be a twist ending, something in which Kruger disappears and everything seems to have been a dream, only for the audience to discover that, well, it's a dream within a dream within a dream. <laughs> When they had submitted the film to the Motion Picture Association of America, it required two cuts in order to grant it an R rating. The theatrical version was released with an R rating and had 13 seconds of cuts, which isn't that bad. 13 seconds, not bad. The uncut version would not see a release in the United States until about 1996, when Elite Entertainment Laserdisc released it. But all the DVD, digital, and Blu-ray releases use the R-rated theatrical version, and the uncut version has yet to be released on a digital format. They just gave us six seconds restored for home video, and then two seconds for current releases. So we don't have a full uncut version of A Nightmare on Elm Street. I don't know if we ever will, but we don't have one right now. We've got an R-rated theatrical version, that's it. And the theatrical version was released in theaters in the United States on November 9th, 1984 through New Line Cinema, and then was released in the UK in 1985 through Palace Pictures. Then the film was first introduced to the home video market by Media Home Entertainment in early 1985, and eventually was released on Laserdisc as well. It's of course, you know, been released on DVD since, so that we can watch it in today's day and age. It was first released on DVD in 1999 as part of the Nightmare on Elm Street collection box set, along with the other six sequels. On April 13th, 2010, the film was re-released on Blu-ray by Warner Home Video, with all the same extras from, a, from the special editions before it, and it also contained a DVD box set. As for the box office of A Nightmare on Elm Street, it premiered in the United States with a limited theatrical release. It only opened in 165 cinemas across the country, but still, on its opening weekend, it made $1.271 million dollars. So it was considered an instant commercial success. The film eventually went on to earn a total of $25,504,513 at both the U.S. and Canadian box office. Worldwide, the movie made $57 million. So they were on a, what, max $1.1 million budget when all was said and done, and they walked away with $57 million. That's like $55 million in profit. Of course this spawned a franchise. No surprise whatsoever. And why did it spawn a franchise? Well, we're about to find out. Without further ado, we're going to dive into our first movie of this Nightmare on Elm Street series and talk about the first Nightmare on Elm Street film. We start off the film with a teenager named Tina Gray. She awakens from a terrifying nightmare where she sees a disfigured man wearing a blade-fixed glove and attacking her in a boiler room. The following morning, Tina's best friend Nancy Thompson and her boyfriend Glenn begin consoling her and they reveal that each of them also had a nightmare the previous night. So the two stay at Tina's house when Tina's mother goes out of town so they can try and keep her safe when she discovers that Nancy also had a nightmare about the same disfigured man. Tina's boyfriend, Rod, interrupts their sleepover, and when Tina falls asleep, she ends up dreaming of this disfigured man chasing her. So Rod gets awakened by Tina thrashing around, and then sees her get dragged and fatally slashed by an unseen force. 
which forces him to run away as Nancy and Glenn wake up to find Tina's bloodied and dead body. The next day, Nancy's father, Don Thompson, who's also a police officer, arrests Rod, despite his pleas of innocence. Later that day at school, Nancy ends up falling asleep in class, and she dreams that the man chases her to the boiler room where she gets cornered. She then deliberately burns her arm on a pipe, and the burn is enough to startle her awake in class. However, she notices that there's a burn mark on her arm from where she placed her arm on that pipe. So Nancy goes to visit Rod at the police station, who describes Tina's death along with his own recent nightmares about the same man stalking her in her dreams. This is where Nancy believes that the man that they're dreaming about is the one who killed Tina. Then when Nancy gets home, she decides that she's going to have a bath. Unfortunately, she ends up falling asleep in the bathtub and is nearly drowned by the man. So Nancy then decides she's going to go on a caffeine kick to, to try and stay awake, and she invites Glenn over to watch over her as she sleeps. So Nancy ends up falling asleep, and in her dream, she sees the man prepare to kill Rod in his cell, but then turns his attention towards her. Nancy runs away, wakes up when her alarm clock goes off, but unfortunately the man ends up killing Rod by wrapping bedsheets around his neck, completely stages it as a suicide via hanging. So at Rod's funeral, Nancy's parents start to become really worried because she's starting to describe her dreams and explain that there's a man who's basically killing all of us kids in our dreams. Her mother, Marge, takes her to a sleep disorder clinic where, in a dream, Nancy ends up grabbing the man's fedora where the name Fred Krueger is written inside the fedora. And that's where we first get who this man is. That This is where we start to understand who Freddy Krueger is. But the thing is, is that he actually is not called Freddy Krueger in the first film. He is Fred Krueger. That is how he is named. That is how he is credited. It's not Freddy yet. He is Fred Krueger. So now Nancy and her family are barricading the house. Marge explains that Fred Krueger was an insane child murderer who had killed 20 children but was released on a technicality. Because of this, parents were fucking pissed, <laughs> right? So they decided that they're going to burn his house down with him in it. So they burn him alive, seeking vigilante justice. So Nancy realizes that Fred Krueger is a vengeful ghost, and he's killing her and her friends out of revenge and to satiate his psychopathic needs. Nancy then tries to call Glenn so she can warn him, don't fall asleep, this guy's going to kill us. But his father prevents her from speaking to him. Glenn, of course, ends up falling asleep, gets killed by Freddy Krueger. Oh, sorry, gets killed by Fred Krueger. <laughs> Can't call him Freddy Krueger yet. So Nancy now decides that she's going to try and take on Freddy Krueger herself. Her boyfriend's dead, her friends are getting slaughtered. She's going to be the one to save the day. So her mom goes to sleep, and she calls her dad, who's across the street investigating Glenn's death, and asks him to break into the house in 20 minutes. Nancy starts rigging booby traps around the house and grabs Kruger out of her dream and then brings him into the real world. The booby traps, they all affect Kruger enough that Nancy can light him on fire and then lock him in the basement. Nancy rushes to the door to try and get help. Police arrive, of course. They find that Kruger has escaped from the basement. So Nancy and Don go upstairs. They find a burning Kruger smothering Marge in her bedroom. Don then extinguishes the fire. Kruger and Marge vanish into the bed. So Don leaves the room. Kruger then rises from the bed behind Nancy. Realizing, though, that Kruger's powered by his victim's fear, Nancy calmly turns her back to him. This is when Kruger evaporates as he attempts to lunge at her. And we believe that everything's good. You know, Nancy didn't believe in him. Nancy just didn't give him the fear. We're good to go. She steps outside into a bright, foggy morning where all her friends and her mother appear to still be alive. Nancy gets into Glenn's convertible so they can go to school, but then a green and red striped top suddenly comes down over that vehicle, and it locks them in the car as they drive uncontrollably down the street. Three girls in white dresses can be seen playing jump rope, and they're heard chanting Kruger's nursery rhyme. Marge is then grabbed by Kruger through the front window to end the movie. Personally, my thoughts on A Nightmare on Elm Street, I think it's a great movie. Do I think it's the best entry in the Nightmare franchise? No. I think there are actually better Nightmare on Elm Street movies than the first one. And I'll tell you why. 
I honestly feel like with A Nightmare on Elm Street, they were holding back. I don't feel like they gave us everything that we could have had in the first film. I really don't. I feel like Craven and everybody else that was involved in the film was holding back. There was so much more that could have been done, could have been explained, that's later done, actually, in uh, later sequels, where they expand on Freddy, they expand on what he's done, his environments, his powers. But I feel like they still could have done a lot more in the first Nightmare on Elm Street to establish Fred Krueger as some sort of force to be reckoned with. They did a good job still in doing that, but I feel like they held back and they could have done more. Instead of waiting for future sequels to expand, they could have done a lot more in the first one. But I don't feel like it took away from it. It just, they could have done more. Now that wraps us up for part one of the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise review. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. I appreciate everyone who gives this podcast a listen. You are all amazing. Make sure you're following me on Instagram, instagram.com slash cabin of horrors podcast. Also on Facebook, cabin of horrors. All of the updates, all of the information, all of the news surrounding the podcast will always be there on social media. So make sure you're following and also twitch.tv slash cabin of horrors. So then that way, when Nightmare on the 13th comes out in April, you're all ready to go. You'll get the notification when we're live. And I'll be back again next week with part two of our Nightmare on Elm Street franchise review, where we go over a Nightmare on Elm Street 2, 3, and 4. I am your host, The Incredible Josh, and until next time, see you in the shadows.